up next on Walking by Faith. The best life, the most fulfilling life, the life with the most joy is not the one that you think it is. It's the one that God has prepared and made ready for you, right? Don't settle for second best, right? And remember this, don't quit. Don't quit. You're going to fight the good fight of faith. Finish the race. Finish the race. Keep the faith. Hello, I want to welcome you to Walking by Faith. Thanks for being with us today. We're going to talk about fulfilling our destiny, our purpose in God. Some of us don't realize this, but God has a destiny. He has a purpose for you. I could say it like this, that God has a promised land for you. He told the children of Israel, I've got this place I want to take you to. It flows with milk and honey which really represents abundance and victory, sweet victory. But God has that same thing for each one of us. He has a place of abundance, a place of victory, a place of purpose for every one of us. And we're going to talk today about that destiny that God has for you. The Bible says in Ephesians that God has prepared paths ahead of time for you to walk in. He's got things ready for you to do. And how do we plug in to what God has for us? Would you please join me right now as this message begins? So today we're starting a new series of messages. We've entitled it Destiny, Fight for It. Jeremiah chapter 29. A very well-known passage of Scripture, verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God has plans for you. They're not to harm you. They're to give you a hope. They're to give you a future. There is, I believe this, I believe that there is destiny, that there is greatness inside of every single one of you. I believe that because the Bible says that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The greater one, the Holy Spirit, he's on the inside of you. And he is not there for a ride. He is there to comfort, to help, to be your standby, to be your counselor. He's there to help us as we face the situations that we face in this life. Now, God will take and see in you what you do not even see in yourself. David was just a young teenager when God took him from the sheep, being a shepherd, and ultimately made him the king of Israel. Moses was hiding on the backside of the desert. He'd been there for 40 years taking care of his father-in-law's sheep when God showed up and said, I'm calling you to be a deliverer. Gideon was hiding in a, in, in a, uh, a wine press from the Midianites, threshing out a little bit of wheat when God showed up and said, Hail, you mighty man of valor. God saw something in him that he did not see in himself. God had put something in him that he didn't realize was there. God had a plan and a purpose and things for him to do that he did not realize. Now, in Psalms 138, what, what, what is true about Gideon, I believe is true about every one of us. God has things in us we don't realize. He has plans and purposes for us that we do not see for ourselves. You know, God's plan, God's purpose, God's destiny for you is bigger than you are. If, in fact, if it doesn't scare you, you haven't hooked into what God's got for you yet. Psalms 138.8, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. God has a purpose, and God is working with you to fulfill that purpose. I want you to think about this. Now, this is in Psalms 139. David is is recollecting, and he's talking about God's plan and purpose for his life. That's what he says. He says, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. He's saying, before you formed me in the womb, he said, and in your book, they were all written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. He said, but well, before I was formed, God, you had a book and you had written about every one of my days. 
all of my life. Your plans and your purpose for my life. All of them were written down before you even had formed me in my mother's womb. And now listen, this, these, two, these next two verses, they're connected to what he just said. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I could number them, they would be more in number than the sands of the sea. Right? Now, David is saying, the thoughts that you had about me before I was even born, things you'd written in your book, are more in number than the sands on the seashores. Think about that. Now, we have a hard time imagining that because we just don't realize how big our God is. I was reading recently, and now through the, uh, the Hubble telescope, they, have, they, they tell us that they know that there are more stars than there are sands of, of, of sand, or grains of sand, on all the seas and all the deserts on earth. They know there's more stars. Our God is so much bigger than we can ever imagine. And his plans and his thoughts about you and me, things that God has for us, our destiny, he said they're more in number than the sands on the seashore. He said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart and I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. Now, it's true about Jeremiah that God has set him apart to be a prophet, but it's true about every one of us that God has plans. He has things for us to do. The Bible says he's prepared paths ahead of time for us to walk in. God just didn't put you on earth and just say, well, just see what happens. He has a plan. He has a purpose. He had a book about David. He had a book about Jeremiah. He's got a book about you, a book about me. He has things like how we're going to fit into the kingdom of God, our flow, our function. Uh, God, again, did not just put us here and say, work it out. All right. He said, I've got good works for you to do. I've got paths prepared ahead of time for you to walk in. And it's important that we realize God did not just leave you here without a purpose. He has a purpose. He has a plan. However, God's purpose and God's plan for your life will not just happen. All right. Let me give you an example of this. God said to the Israelites, he said, now, I'm taking you out of Egypt and I am bringing you to the promised land. He said, this is a place that flows with milk and honey. And by the way, that milk and honey, it represents success and sweet victory. Right? For you and my, and by the way, God has a promised land for you. He has a promised land for me. But he told him, I'm going to bring you to this promised land. I swore I'd do this. I told Abraham I was going to give it to his descendants. I'm giving it to you. All right? Now, here's my question. Did they possess that land or not? They did not. They did not. In fact, they spent 40 years in a desert and all of them died. They didn't get what God wanted them to have. God brought them right up to the promised land. And they said, we can't go in. There's giants. There's walled cities. There's seven nations more powerful than we are. There's iron chariots. We can't go in. They doubted God. Literally, they were not willing to fight. And because they weren't willing to fight for the plan, the destiny that God had for them, they went back in the desert. And they spent 40 years in that desert. 40 years wandering in a desert. Listen, this is what the Bible says. It is 11 days journey from Horeb by way of Mount Sayer to Kadesh Barnea. It should have taken them 11 days to get into the promised land. It took them 40 years. And the people that God said, I'm going to give it to you. All you need to do is go in and take possession. None of them, except for Joshua and Caleb, went in and took possession because they were not willing to fight. Listen, Jesus said the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Christianity, I know people think Christianity is a crutch. Let me just tell you something. Christianity does not work for milk toast Christians. You will never have God's best if you will not fight. You will never have God's best if you believe I'm just going to sit here under this tree and God's blessings are just going to fall on me like ripe cherries off this tree. It's not going to happen. They missed God's best. They missed God's destiny, God's plan for them because they were not willing to fight. And the truth is that you and I, we need to fight, the Bible says, the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Right? When, when you become a Christian, whether you realize it or not, you are brought into 
the kingdom of God and a war. Right? There is a spiritual warfare that is taking place. It's in Ecclesiastes 8 where it says, and there is no release from that war. You might well say, I don't want to fight. Tough. You're in a war anyhow. There is no release from that war. There is no release. The only way is to get trampled by the enemy or to trample the enemy. Right? The kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 1 says, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on. Now, this is Hebrews 12. The 11th chapter of Hebrews is God's who's who list. It's God's heroes of the faith. And he talks about Moses and he talks about Joshua. He talks about Rahab. He talks about Samson. He talks about Isaiah. He talks about all these great men and women of faith and how they believed God and wrought victory, got, got what God planned for them, fulfilled their purpose and their destiny. And he says, they're all cheering us on, right? And literally he's saying they're, they're kind of like looking over the banisters of heaven and they're watching you and I run our spiritual race. He says, it means we'd better get with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race that we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, the cross, the shame, whatever. And now he's there in a place of honor right alongside God. I want you to notice the first thing he tells us to do. He says, never quit. And then he says, keep your eyes on Jesus. How many of you are fighting some battle in your life? Right. Do you know everybody's fighting a battle? Somebody said this. They said, be kind to everybody you meet because everyone is fighting a great battle. Everybody fights a battle. Right? Now, the Bible says, keep your eyes on Jesus. I'm going to tell you why. Because there is not a single person alive that will not at some time blow it, sometime fail, in some way. It may be big, it may be small. But I like to say it like this, everybody's feet stink. <laughs> All right? But everybody is human. And if, if you set your eyes on a person, any person, there's going to be something that disappoints you in their life. You know, if you are ever going to have a great victory, you're going to have to fight a great battle. We all want great victories, but we don't want great battles. But great victories come after great battles, right? Now, the Bible says Paul, the apostle, he wrote this. Uh, at this time, he's 60 plus years old. He's in prison and he's waiting in Rome and he's waiting for his execution. He's been condemned to death. And he writes his protege, Timothy. And he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. He sums up his whole life in 17 words. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. No regrets, no reservations, no retreats. What a way to finish. But notice what he calls the Christian life, the good fight. The good fight. The Christian life is a fight. Right? Now, they say Paul was, they, they believe he was a short man, probably around four foot six inches tall. Not a large man of stature. But he was a thousand times bigger on the inside than he was on the outside. He was a crusader for God. Literally taking the hearts of men and women, capturing them for the kingdom of God. He said that he was a wise master builder. He said, and I'm, I'm building on the foundation, the only foundation that will last. And that is the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He literally shook continents for God. When he showed up in one city, they said, those who have turned the world upside down, they have come here also. He wrote almost half of the new books in the New Testament. He was the greatest missionary apostle that there has ever been. He, he did more than any one of the original apostles who spent years with Jesus. He had the greatest revelation of the gospel of anyone. But what made him great was not his intellect, not even his revelation. It, it wasn't his talent, his skill. But what made him great was that he would not quit. Tons of opposition, but he just kept on going. 
Like Jesus, he kept going because he was looking to his reward, looking where he was going. Now, the Bible says he was reviled. He just pressed on. He was stoned. The Bible says they took him outside the city. They stoned him. Now, whether he was dead or not, I'm not sure. But this is what the Bible says. The disciples came and they gathered around him. They made a circle around him. Now, how many of you know what us Christians do when we make a circle? We pray. And then afterwards, the Bible says he gets up. Maybe he was dead. The Bible doesn't say one way or the other. Right? But he gets up. Now, if I was Paul, I would have at least left town. <laughs> but Paul doesn't leave. He goes back into town. After they just stoned him. They stone him. He just presses on. They don't believe him. He presses on. They throw him in prison. You realize when Paul got to town, Paul did not go to the Hyatt. What are the rooms like? He checked out the jail because that's where he was going to end up. He spent years there. Every place he goes, he gets thrown in prison. So what does he do? He presses on. He shipwrecked. He presses on. He snake bit. He presses on. The Bible says, he said, three times I've been beaten with rods. Now, this is what they would do. It was an ancient punishment. They would take off your sandals. They tie your feet together. They hang you upside down, and they beat the bottom of your feet with rods until they break bones. Three times beaten with rods. What does he do? Presses on. Five times, he said, I received 39 lashes. What does he do? Presses on. All right. They call him a liar. He presses on. They call him a heretic. They press on. He presses on. He said, everyone forsook me. He was in prison and every friend forsook him. He said, but the Lord didn't forsake me. And he said, I pressed on. Yes. Philippians chapter 3. Paul writes, and this is what he says. He says, brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended. And I think this is, this is phenomenal, phenomenal advice and insight. Any time that you or I think that we have arrived, we're in really big trouble. When you think, I, I, you know, me and God, we just got it going on. I don't need to grow. I don't need to pray. I'm there. I'm just, I'm at the pinnacle of spirituality. Paul had a vision of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 12 says he went to heaven and came back, wrote half the New Testament, and he said, I have not arrived. I haven't arrived. We need to stay humble and stay hungry. Stay hungry for God. But he says, but this one thing I do. So in other words, if Paul could come today and preach to us, and we said, Paul, you can give one sermon, that's it. Just tell us one thing, that's all you can do. This is what Paul would tell us, right? This one thing I do. He says, forgetting the things that are behind. Listen, the devil is fixated on your past in my past. The devil wants to remind you of every sin, every failure, every shortcoming, every disappointment, every hurt, every bit of rejection, everything that ever happened to you. He wants to keep it in your today, keep it in front of you. He knows if he can that your past can limit your future. But listen, God does not consult your past to determine your future. He doesn't look where you've been. He's looking where he's going to take you, all right? So he says, this, this one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind. And he says, I reach forward to those things that are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He said, I keep pressing to fulfill my destiny, my purpose, the things that God has called me to. All kinds of opportunities to quit, but he never quit. Right? The Bible says this, talking particularly about Abraham, but about the saints. It says they would have found constant opportunity to return to it, to their past. If you're looking to return, the devil will make sure you have a lots of opportunities to go backwards. I like what somebody said. I believe this. Try Jesus because the devil will always take you back. The Bible says there's going to be all kinds of opportunities for you and I to quit. There's going to be opposition. As sure as you try to move ahead in God, the devil is going to say, I'm going to put opposition there. I'm going to oppose what you're doing. Somebody said to me, well, the devil never bothers me. That's because you aren't doing anything. <laughs> you start doing something, you start moving ahead, and there's going to be opposition. All right? You're just going to, you know, here's what Paul's saying. Don't quit. 
Keep going. Do not quit on your dreams. Don't quit on your marriage. Don't quit striving and moving to be the man of God, the woman of God that God has called you to be. Think about this. The Apostle Paul, he just wouldn't quit. He gets saved and he immediately begins to preach and they try to kill him. So he has to climb up on a wall and they let him in, a, put him in a basket and they let him down a window in the wall so he can escape because they're trying to kill him. Now, I don't know about you, but when somebody's trying to kill me, that could have been a sign like, hey, maybe I ought to back off. But not Paul. He keeps pressing on. He ends up, he goes to Jerusalem and he tries to join the disciples, the followers of Jesus. But the last time he was there just a month ago, he was trying to kill all the Christians. So the Christians are like, no, we don't want to have anything to do with you, you know. Uh, he could have got offended. Why, the Christians don't even want to accept me. No, he didn't get offended. He didn't quit. He just kept on pressing on. Now, Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do the good works which God predestined, planned beforehand. I don't care who you are, God has planned good works for you to do, and not once a year. He's planned good works for you to do. Right? The Bible says he's predestined, planned beforehand for us. Taking paths he prepared ahead of time. Do you get that? God has prepared paths for you and me, for every single one of us. All right? I love the rest of this, that we should walk in them living the good life that he prearranged and made ready for us to live. I want you to listen. There is no life that will give you more joy, more fulfillment than the life that God has planned for you. You might think you've got your, your, your plan is the best plan. I'm telling you, God's plan is the best plan. You know, you go to Costa Rica, <clears throat> they call it the land of the happy medium. Um, there's not, the, 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 the middle class is just, is just huge. But you, you go to Costa Rica, and you know, we say, hello, how you doing? In Costa Rica, they go, pura vida, pura vida. And it literally means pure life, if you were just going to take a straight translation, all right? But, but what it literally, this is how it translates. It says, life is good, enjoy it. Life is good, enjoy it. In fact, when you turn to somebody and say, pura vida, look at that, you speak Spanish. <laughs> pura vida, all right? Life is good, enjoy it, live it. Well, I want to tell you something. The best life, the Pura Vida life, is the good life that God has prepared and made ready for you to live. Right? The best life, the most fulfilling life, the life with the most joy is not the one that you think it is. It's the one that God has prepared and made ready for you. Right? Don't settle for second best. Right? And remember this, don't quit. Don't quit. You're going to fight the good fight of faith. Finish the race. Finish the race. Keep the faith. You know, the great people of, of history, we, we, we look at them, and they were not people who had life easy. They're the people who had to fight. Right? Do you even think about Abraham Lincoln? Most Americans rate Abraham Lincoln as our greatest president. Right? Now, Abraham Lincoln... He had a lot of problems. You know, he, he went broke in business. He had a men, total mental breakdown when his fiance or girlfriend died. He, he tried to get elected a number of times and failed. But he had that I won't quit attitude. And when he became president and we went into the, the, the Civil War and the North was getting defeated and defeated and defeated and defeated, do you know what? He had that attitude like, we're going to keep fighting. We're, gonna, not, we're, gonna, we're not going to give up. We're going to press on, press on, press on. By the way, if, if you go home and get on your, your computer and your, your, your Bible, check out your concordance, this is what you're going to find. Because I, I looked up a while back the word quit because, you know, we're putting a sermon together about never quit. And this is what I found out about the word quit. When you look for a quit in the Bible, it says no match is found. You say, what does that mean? That means God doesn't even use the word quit. God doesn't even believe in quitting. There's not one quit in the whole Bible. Not one quit in the entire word of God. He's got a lot of Shirley's, a lot of yeses, and a lot of amens, but no quits. No quits. Think about it. Abraham, he lied about his wife, said that he was his sister, 
and a king takes her and tries to marry her. I mean, that was not, that was not good. But how I many you know what? God still used Abraham. Noah got drunk. Paul was a murderer. David committed adultery. Moses failed to deliver the people of Israel 40 years before. Gideon was a zero. He's hiding in a wine press. Peter denies Jesus three times, cussing and swearing while he does it. But you know what? God uses people that failed. God uses people that have failed that get back up. God doesn't use quitters. Judas was a quitter, went out and hung himself. Ahithophel was a quitter. He went and committed suicide. Proverbs 24, 16, the righteous man may fall seven times, but he rises again. The wicked shall fall by calamity. When you, when, when you get knocked down, when you fall, the righteous thing to do is get back up. The unrighteous thing to do is to stay down. Right? You're going to have opportunities to quit. The unrighteous quit. The Bible says, but the righteous they get back up. They say, I'm not finished. I'm pressing on towards the prize, towards the goal, towards the destiny that God has for me. You know, as we've been talking about destiny, if you realize that your destiny is not hooked up with God right now, that you're away from the Lord, that you, you, you need to come home, that you need forgiveness, you need to get right with God. If that's you, I want to invite you right now to bow your head and to pray a prayer, to surrender your life to Jesus and receive the forgiveness that God has for you. Just make these words your own. Just say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. And I believe he rose again. I receive him today as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to live for him every day. I thank you. You've heard my prayer, that my past is gone, that I'm your child a part of your family on my way to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you prayed that simple prayer from your heart, God heard your prayer and you are right with God. And I wrote a book that I'd like you to read. It'll help you as you keep becoming a follower of Jesus. All you need to do is go online, download the book free of charge. All the information is right there on your screen. And I want to say thank you for being with us today. We love you. And if this program is blessing you and helping you grow spiritually, would you become a partner with us? Pray for us and send a financial gift and help us as we're taking the gospel to the nations of the world. Thank you. God bless you. Would you like someone to begin standing with you in prayer? If so, please do not hesitate to call. Walking by Faith Prayer Partners will be glad to stand with you in prayer. If you would like to purchase today's teaching, we have it available on DVD for $8 and CD for $6. To order, just call or visit walkingbyfaith.tv. Thank you for watching Walking by Faith. Walking by Faith is made possible in part by the generous gifts of our viewers. If you would like to contribute to reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ through this program, please contact us at Walking by Faith, 5120 Ivan Rest Avenue Southwest, Granville, Michigan, 49418.